Hey guys, we have made it to our last packet and you have done an amazing job. So let's just jump right in. This is part two of evolution, mostly focusing on human evolution. So the question of the day, are humans still evolving? And as always, we will come back to that. And for the pre-lecture, um, you should have those filled in. So I'm not going to go over any of this today. And we're going to jump straight to comparative anatomy between a chimpanzee and a human. So compared to a chimpanzee, a human has, and we're going to make a list here. The first one is a spinal cord that exits from the center of the base of the skull rather than the rear. So if you look down here, it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but, and if you, if you look at a human skull and turn it upside down, you have the foramen magnum, which is where the spinal cord exits in the brainstem. Um, and it comes straight down. And so if you were to stick like a ruler or something up it, it would be coming straight out like this. Whereas with a chimpanzee, it exits more from the rear. And so it comes out like this. And so what this does is allows humans to stand more upright than the chimpanzees. Compared to a chimpanzee, a human has an S-shaped spine. So if we look at our picture here, again, it's kind of hard to see here, but it's an S-shaped spine, whereas the chimpanzee has more of a C-shaped spine. Again, this is better for walking because it allows the humans to have a better center of balance and, of course, to stand more upright. And if we look at the pelvis next, compared to a chimpanzee, a human has a broad bowl-shaped pelvis. Whereas a chimpanzee has a narrow and tall pelvis. So again, at our picture down here, see it's more broad and bowl shaped, whereas the chimpanzee is just tall and narrow. Just going to make for different walking styles. Next, if we look at the femur, the upper leg bone, the femur points down and medi medially towards the middle, it angles towards the knee. Whereas the chimpanzee is outward from the center, or what we call lateral.
So if we look down here, the human's femur kind of angles in towards the knee, whereas the chimpanzees kind of go out. So if you think of someone that's bow-legged, they kind of have a, a gait more like a chimpanzee. They kind of, what's the word? Um, swagger is coming to mind. They walk differently than the human. Humans have a stronger knee joint compared to a chimpanzee. Humans have a big toe that is fixed and not opposable. So in our picture here, you can see the opposable big toe of the chimpanzee. We do not have that. And last of all, arched feet. Which make it easier for walking. You can see that in this picture as well. The chimpanzee's feet are more flat. We have an arch in our foot. Um, some people have more of a flat arch, and if you do, it can be painful to walk long distances, so I hear. Um, so in the yellow box here, the human body is highly adapted for upright walking, which we call bipedalism. Um, so we already kind of talked about this, but make sure you understand how each of the listed dip listed differences between the human and the chimp skeleton could be an adaptation for a bipedalism. And I didn't get a chance to watch that, but if you want to type in that URL and give it a watch, I'm sure it's good. <laughs> and then this diagram down here just kind of goes over everything we've written up here. So there we were looking at differences talk about evolutionary trees for a minute. So evolutionary trees show evolutionary relationships between species and a node indicates a common ancestor. So on our evolutionary tree here, anywhere you see like an intersection like this, these would all be nodes. And they indicate common as an ancestors to everything beyond that. So you can see here that um, humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. And all of these share a common ancestor with this um, species right there, whatever that is, I can't read that. Branches are lineages to specific species. So these would be branches, for example. So the main thing to know here is the difference between a node and a branch and what they represent. The molecular clock is the time from divergence measured through DNA mutations. And divergence here would be happening at the nodes.
So the next bullet point, mutations occur independently and randomly after divergence. Remember, mutations are always random. Sometimes they are advantageous, sometimes they are detrimental, and sometimes they are neither. And I'm trying to talk and write at the same time, independently. And, oh, no wonder I didn't know what this was. Um, this common ancestor here, we don't know who this species is because, we, like we talked about before, the fossil record is incomplete. Because only about 1% of living things end up becoming fossils, and then we only find a small fraction of that. So... Back to this, at divergent, DNA is identical, but changes with time and longer apart will equal more mutations and therefore um, more differences in these relatives or cousins, we'll say. So an important thing to note, and I really have to emphasize this with my seventh graders because we do teach a little bit of human evolution, is that humans didn't evolve from chimpanzees, but we share a common ancestor. So on this, this evolutionary tree here, you don't see chimpanzees branching off into humans, but we shared a common ancestor at one time, um, and then we branched off into different species. Mutations occurred, natural selection occurred, and now we ended up with humans and chimpanzees. Because they always ask, well, how come chimpanzees aren't still turning into humans? Well, we, that's not how it works. We just share a common ancestor. Okay, scientific classification. It's a ranking of closely related species. And with um, binomial nomenclature, or the scientific name of a species, it goes genus first, the genus name, then species. So an example over here, and scientific names are typically italicized or underlined. So we have Canis familiaris, is a scientific name, and also Canis lupus. And you might not know what either of those things are, but they say, share the same genus name, so genus name here, species name here, um, the more closely related they are. So I'm just going to say closely related. And so Canis familiaris, those are dogs, and Canis lupus are wolves. And we know that those are closely related, so they have the same genus name. All right, we've got to talk about a genus called Australopithecus, and these are early hominins. They were discovered in Africa, and if you've ever heard of Lucy, her scientific name is Australopithecus afarensis. Oops, I'm already messing up the spelling. Australopithecus. That's a C. Afarensis. And for the record, the, the genus name is always capitalized and the species name is lowercase. 
and it is thought that this genus gave rise to the genus Homo. which we are a part of, Homo sapiens. And just some of the characteristics of the Australopithecus, they have an ape-like brain size and face. Their arms were long compared to their legs, but they had a human-like pelvis and lower leg skeleton. And um, what's interesting about the Australopithecus is they have similarities of both like apes and chimps and humans and there also have been footprints discovered that shows that they walked upright and that there were two individuals walking together here. Um, these footprints date to about 2.9 million years ago. They're called the Latoli footprints and they are believed to be attributed to the Australopithecus afarensis shows two individuals walking bipedally upright together and it looks possibly like an adult and a smaller adult or juvenile so maybe like a mama and a little kid walking together okay so let's focus on the genus homo which is what we're a part of um characteristics of this genus is we have a larger brain size and we're not the only species in this genus by the way human-like jaws and teeth We have found evidence of tool use, probably because our big brains. And they're all bipedal, walk upright on two legs. So on this chart here, we have down here millions of years ago, and right here is Lucy, the Australopithecus afarensis. And when something um, ends here, that means it became extinct or evolved into something else. And here we have Homo hab habilis and then Homo sapiens, which is us. So you can see here um, Homo sapiens, Homo, Homo neanderthalensis, there are Homo erectus, Homo, I can't talk today, Homo habilis, Homo ergaster. So a bunch of those, and um, I believe, yeah, we're the only existing homo genus today. So examples of the genus homo, we have, hor why do I keep wanting to say horm hormones? I've been talking about hormones. Homo florensiensis. Um, these were discovered on the island of Flores, Indonesia. They're about three feet tall, so shorter than Homo sapiens, and dated to be about um, 18,000 years ago. And it's possible that they diverged from an earlier Homo species. Possibly Homo erectus. In this case, erectus meaning walking upright, if you, if you catch the relationship. And probably an example of island dwarfism.
So island dwarfism, if they were isolated to an island, you would imagine they don't have a ton of resources available, especially if they can't leave anywhere, have any resources coming in and out. And so this could have led to smaller body sizes. Um, let's see, part of my notes were cut out, but these were discovered in 2000, these are three or an eight. And there's a debate to whether they're microcephalic. This is half cut off. I'm gonna skip that part. Um, okay, let's move down to Homo neanderthalensis, also known as Neanderthals. They have, this is what we have, think they may have looked like based on their skulls, large jaws and a prominent brow ridge. They were more muscular than humans. They did have a slightly larger brain. And they think that is possibly to control more muscles. They had advanced tools. And something interesting is that they buried their dead with flowers and tools. Um, so this is evidence of symbolic thoughts and funeral rites. And I've heard also that they're buried facing east. I don't know if that's true or not but bury their dead with flowers. And tools. Evidence of symbolic thoughts, maybe funeral rites. Um, these are dated to 400,000 years ago to about 40,000 years ago. And overall, they're more robust and larger body than humans. And we do have evidence that they interbred with humans. Because if you get your DNA sequenced through any of those, um, ancestry.com or whatever, or just based on studies that they've done, one to 4% of the human genome comes from Neanderthals. So it was likely that they were displaced by humans, although they did integrate some, and ancient DNA evidence shows high inbreeding toward the end of their range. Just a fun fact there. Okay, Denisovians lived in Asia at the same time as Neanderthals were living in Europe. And it is also thought that they interbred with humans. And if you're of Southeast Asian descent, they contain up to 
Denisovan DNA. So all we have for evidence of these are toe bone and teeth, a toe bone and some teeth that were discovered in 2008. And in 2012, a long bone shard was found. So um, very scrappy but amazing ancient DNA insight because we can get DNA from that. And here's the tooth compared to a human tooth. You can see it's huge compared, comparatively. And also like the Neanderthals, they were either displaced or integrated. with Homo sapiens. All right, Homo sapiens, that's us. Originated in Africa and migrated out about 100,000 years ago. And there's a very high phenotypic variation. If you look at lots of different humans, there's a lot of variation um, because we have a wide distribution where humans are on every continent worldwide. Um, and so these phenotype variations are in response to local environmental conditions. So for example, if you live in a colder climate, or your ancestors evolved in that area, typically you see short limbs, a large torso, and this is because you have less surface area for volume, for heat loss. If you have those shorter limbs, there's not as much surface area for heat to escape from your body. And if you live in a hot climate, or your ancestors evolved in a hot climate, you would see longer limbs and a thin torso. Oh, my hand dry is getting so sloppy today, I'm sorry. This is so you have more surface area to volume ratio. Which would result in more heat loss, which would be a good thing if you're in a hot environment keep you cool. So here are two examples. You got a hot environment here. You can see the long limbs and the thin torso, whereas in a colder environment, shorter limbs and a longer torso or larger torso. So question of the day, are humans still evolving? Yes. <laughs> know that for the extra credit on the exam. I'm going to read through a couple examples and if you want to jot down some notes you can but I'm not going to write this all out. So some examples are lactase persistence which is a lactase gene to digest lactose. It's normally turned off at adulthood but the mutation allows for continued production of lactase um, found in many people descended from herding populations that relied on milk products for sustenance. So those of us that can digest lactose are the mutants because <laughs> there's a mutation that allows us to continue to break down um, the lactose and that was an advantage if you lived in herding populations that used milk for sustenance.
There also is the HIV resistance example from the HIV lecture, if you want to check back on that one. Some people have a mutation that makes them resistant to that. And then the sickle cell allele, and this is interesting. So heterozygotes for the sickle cell gene, so those that would have an allele that does code for sickle cell anemia and one that doesn't for that gene, are more resistant to malaria than homozygotes that just have two alleles that don't code for sickle cell anemia. Therefore, while homozygous recessive genotypes result in sickle cell anemia, the sickle cell allele still persists in populations of the world where malaria is endemic because it's an advantage to, an advantage to just inherit one allele, but a disadvantage to inherit both recessive alleles to, because then you end up with um, sickle cell anemia. So that's it. That's our last packet. I will have some information coming on the final exam soon. So either watch for an announcement or for a short video about it and message me with any questions.